I'm also looking at the rise of hobbies and uh, and amateur stonework and how a lot of our gem gemologic techniques were actually invented by amateurs, which means just lovers as opposed to professionals. The amateur is the lover. And hobbies, I don't know if you know, but the word hobby comes from a hobbled horse. And so you would hobble a horse meet, to keep it from running, that's hobbling it with a, with a, a stick or a, a, a string. And then kids would ride a hobbled horse for play, a, a horse on a stick. And riding a hobbled horse becomes riding a hobby horse, and then that becomes a hobby. And so hobbies become this so-called job you can't lose in the Great Depression mm -hmm. in the 1930s, and then they explode. Um, and so when I was a kid, people would collect coins or stamps or fossils or this or that. So I'm interested in that collecting passion. So it's interesting, um, the development of hobbies, because it feels like the future of human civilization will be very hobby-driven. Like um, some of the, like I, I often now, because of this particular little thing I'm doing with the podcast, I get to interact with photographers and videographers, and I'm disappointed to find how many professionals are not very good and how many hobbyists are very good. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so it's almost- Well, if they're amateurs, they're the lovers. I mean, the you lovers, can think yes. that, that's what that means from um, amour. You're an amateur if you're a lover of the thing and it you're not in it for the money. Yeah. You're in it because you, you're obsessed. But the sort of as the uh, GDP, as the, um, as our freedom grows to sort of financially to be able to have a hobby, um, it feels like there'll be more lovers, more amateurs in the world, and not just for the artistic pursuits, but like science, uh, technology development, building, you know, uh, building all kinds of technologies almost like as a, as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, you have much more freedom to figure out what is the thing you love doing. And actually over time, that just, you won't even notice, but it'll start making money. <laughs> And yeah, that's really fascinating. And yeah, it does kind of, uh, I mean, w when did that originate? Just the collection, well, the, the widespread? The, it goes through different stages. People have always gathered the odd thing to make something else. But you also get this tradition of what's called curiosity cabinets, <laughs> especially in the Renaissance. Yeah which replaced the kind of treasure chambers of the ancient sultans or kings or whatever. And you get these curiosity cabinets that were often linked with magical practices, alchemical practices. People would gather bezoirs or they would gather, they would have an alligator hanging from the ceiling or they would have a rare, you know, shrunken head or whatever. And that's part of the rise of natural history, the idea that you taxonomize the world, you classify the world, you look for the rare object, the rarity. And rarity still is a, is a kind of virtue, like the recent news about trying to figure out ball lightning. When I was growing up, ball lightning was the big question. Does it exist? Does it not exist? And now there's new evidence of how it actually might. Wait, what, exist. really? There's new evidence? Yeah, yeah there's new evidence. I grew up with that. Uh, my dad, when I was young, told me, I asked him, like, how do I win a Nobel Prize? He said, uh, invent a time machine or figure out how ball lightning works. And then, so I got really excited. I was like, damn it, I'm gonna figure out how this ball lightning works. It's very interesting from a history of science point of view because it's so rare that in a way it doesn't it's, exist. It, you can't replicate it, you can't make it. Does it really exist? It's a little bit like Libyan glass. Another thing I collect is Libyan glass, which is a tektite which falls as a result of a meteorite, a meteorite hits the earth, blasts earth up into space, it falls back down mm -hmm. as a glass. That's called a tektite. And there's a rare form of it called Libyan glass, which fell probably around 20 million years ago and now works out of the Sahara every now and then. It was the most valuable stone of antiquity. The centerpiece of Tutankhamun's breastplate is made of this beautiful yellow gemstone Libyan glass. So rarity is something that, that the hobbyists have always liked to, mm -hmm. 